Good afternoon. So glad to have you here today for this powerful Productive Choice webinar series, Religion and Repro Learning Center. And we are so honored to have you with us today. But before I introduce you to the amazing panelists we have, I want to tell you about a few things that are coming up as part of the Learning Center. So our very next webinar series will be on looking at reproductive oppression and specifically relating to African-American experience. And that will be called property and products. That will be followed by four, four more webinars and we're gonna close it with a conversation with state legislators who will talk with us about the introduction of anti-abortion bills and pro-choice bills within state legislatures. And that will be a very, very important conversation, but don't miss any of them. If you have not gotten the information about how to register for our upcoming webinars, please go to rcrc.org and look for the Religion and Repro Learning Center and you will get some really important information. We don't want you to miss any of them. Today, we will have opportunity for you to ask questions of our panelists. We will retain the last 15 minutes for audience participation. And even though we can't see you, we know you're there and we're so glad. So we wanna hear your questions. There is a chat space, but there's also a question and answer, a Q and A space. Put your questions in Q and A. And there's this process where you can upvote someone's question. If you said, oh, that's exactly the question I wanted to ask, please do vote and move it up because even though we will have 15 minutes for Q&A, of course, that won't be enough time for all of the rich conversations that we know will be there. But we will see all of your questions and hold them. They might inform us with some other webinars we will do soon. So I want to jump right in and introduce these amazing folks today. First, I want to introduce Catherine Joyce, who is an amazing author and journalist. And she is the author of The Child Catchers, Rescue, Trafficking, and the New Gospel of Adoption. And the book she wrote before that is called Quiverful, Inside the Christian Patriarchy Movement. Both of them are powerful books. Get them if you don't already have them. Her writing has appeared in New York Times, The American Prospect, Slate, The Atlantic, Mother Jones, The Nation, Salon, Newsweek, on and on and on. And she is the recipient of the 2011 Night Loose Fellowship in Global Religion Reporting and the recipient of the 2010 Maggie Award. Busy lady. Also today we have J. Ron Kim, who is a PhD of social work and she's assistant professor in the School of Social Work and Criminal Justice at University of Washington at Tacoma. J. Ron's research has focused on the intersection of adoption and disabilities and race and transnational experience for adoptees. While working at the Center for advanced studies in child welfare at the University of Minnesota, J. Ron was instrumental in the development of permanency and adoption competency certification program, which trains welfare and, I mean, child welfare and mental health practitioners regarding the needs of adoptees, adoptive parents, and first slash birth parents powerful work that she has been doing and is doing. Thank you, J-Ron. And then I'm gonna hand it over after this to our moderator for today, Dr. Sue Ellen Bronlin, who is the board chair for the Religious Coalition of Reproductive Choice. Dr. Bronlin, after practicing medicine for 25 years, now focuses on sexuality education and reproductive 
health rights, justice, freedom. And she is also the co-president of the Indiana RCRC. And she does a lot of uh, testifying and advocacy at the Indiana State House. Um, she is one of the folks who helped launch our whole lives, the sexuality and faith program. And she's a busy person. So I'm going to hand this over to Sue Ellen now. So remember, get your questions in, keep them rolling, and Sue Ellen and I will make sure we get to as many of those questions as possible throughout our time today. Thank you, Sue Ellen. Thank you, Carrie. And I only just launched that at our church. It wasn't like I launched the whole thing. So to be very clear, I am so happy you're both with us today. Catherine, your work came to my attention after the earthquake in Haiti. I went down on a medical mission within that first week and I saw some things that did concern me. I saw a middle-aged man, a white man boarding an airplane with a small black child as we were leaving, just things that struck me odd. And we met a team of people. We just asked, what are you doing here? And they were here to rescue children. It, and I did not understand that. I was disturbed, I was haunted. And then I read your book in 2013 and got some clarity on that. So I'm so happy you're here to talk with us. What is it that prompted you to write The Child Catchers? Um, it, Short answer or, or longer answer now? <laughs> well, uh, go ahead, go ahead. Um, we're never gonna have enough time for this. Right, we right. need to talk about it more. Sure, well, first, thank you so much for, for having me, for having us. Um, it's a real honor to be here. Um, it's really nice to see some familiar faces. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I started working on adoption, I guess around 2008 or 2009. Um, and I, I was first prompted uh, because of the prior work that I had done. Um, I, I had written this first book, uh, Quiverful, um, which was about, yeah, it was about this anti-feminist, anti-contraception patriarchy movement. They, they claim that term, patriarchy movement, uh, that believed basically um, that the kind of most fervent uh, pro-life witness that they could give was welcoming as many children as God gives you. So they ended up with very large families, um, a lot of times anyway, uh, you know, six, eight, 10, 12 kids, biological children. And then after I'd been reporting on them for a couple of years, I noticed that they were also starting to adopt um, in, in pretty large numbers. And mm -hmm. sometimes these families, which already had eight biological kids, were all of a sudden adopting six new children all at once. Um, and, you know, being, you know, very vocal about it, writing about it in their movement magazines, on social media to the extent that they were there on their websites. Um, and I, it really, it piqued my curiosity at first. Um, you know, I had thought of adoption primarily before as something, you know, that was probably more related um, to, you know, couples dealing with infertility or, or, you know, prospective parents dealing with infertility. I hadn't thought of this as, as something that would, people would sort of do. As, as a movement or as um, you know, a felt religious calling. And mm -hmm. I started looking into this more and, and I realized um, you know, I was looking at a pretty niche group. Um, you know, quiverful families are quite fundamentalist, um, you know, very into homeschooling, kind of extreme gender roles. Uh, you know, these are not mainstream evangelicals, but I, I realized um, the more I looked into it that this was actually a much larger movement. Um, this was something that you know was you know present again in in much more mainstream evangelical churches and, and growing a lot at that time really starting to take off and and turn into a mass movement um and the more i looked into it also um the more i realized i'm looking at this specific kind of christian adoption movement that is flourishing right now uh, but a lot of the ethical issues that are coming up are a lot more evergreen um, and they they apply to, to secular and religious adoption, um, to domestic and international adoption alike. You know, that there are lots of different wrinkles and distinctions between them, but a lot of the core ethical issues are the same. That's so interesting. And, um, and now that we're, 
your book was written in 2013 and we're looking at a bunch of kids having disappeared from detention centers. And I'm wondering like, how you put all that together. And um, I can remember also being in our whole lives uh, training, we we're talking about safety of uh, young children. It, it was in Michigan. And um, one of the participants was a foster parent with his wife and going through certification and was disturbed by the agency they were working with and changed to a different agency. And that caught my attention. Um, how, what is happening? How is this regulated? Um, are you talking specifically about kind of the separated children? Um, yeah, well, not specifically, but, but tell us what you want to tell us about that. About regulation of adoption in, in general, I mean, I think it varies widely um, and wildly. Like a lot of people, when I was reporting my book and, um, you know, my book came out in 2013, that's a while ago now. Um, a lot of things have, have changed and kind of grown and adapted since then. Um, and we can talk some more about that as well. Uh, but when I was reporting it, um, you know, a lot of people kind of told me in effect, you know, adoption is like the wild west. Um, you know, it is, you know, some, some of these agencies are really just flying by the seat of their pants, um, doing things in really slipshod manner, uh, employing really unethical means of, you know, sometimes recruiting children for adoption, um, sometimes misleading, uh, you know, first parents, families of origin about what adoption means, sometimes in terms of kind of the vetting of the adoptive families or how the adoptive families are treated. I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's a very human uh, enterprise. And so kind of all of the human complications come into it. And then on the other hand, there are you know, agencies that are a lot more diligent and ethical and trying to, you know, abide by best standards, trying, I think, to do the, do the right thing and, and do their best by all of the parties involved. So it's really a, a massive spectrum. Um, and, you know, I, I, I hate to generalize too much, but, uh, you know, in terms of international adoption, um, you know, I think one of kind of the, the big, unrecognized realities, um, not, not for people like J. Ron who deals with this day in and day out, I know, but like uh, people, I think just the general public, unless they're involved or invested in adoption in some way, don't understand how dramatically that has changed um, as a field, as an industry in, you know, the last 15 years, but especially the last like eight or 10. Um, you know, the, the numbers of international adoptions coming into the US now are about a seventh to an eighth of what they were at their high point in really? the 2004. I think there was 23,000 children who came, who were internationally adopted to the US in 2004. Um, in 2019, which I think is the last or the most recent numbers we have, it was less than 3,000. Um, so that dramatic fall off in numbers has just shifted the entire conversation um, in, in some pretty big ways, but has also made, um, you know, it, it, it has kind of lent a color to a lot of the other things that have happened. Um, I, I did a little bit of reporting about the, the family separations in 2018, um, for which Jaron uh, very kindly lent her expertise, um, you know, but we, we talked about then, and Jaron, I think um, you and I had this conversation about how, you know, that reality within kind of adoption land, knowing how much those numbers have fallen, um, what a change that has meant for the adoption industry with agencies clothing, closing, um, even adoption lobbying groups have closed up shop as a result of this, um, that that has meant uh, there is even more now kind of than ever, there, there is this demand um, that is not matched by a supply. And so when the families were being separated at the border, there was you know, this panicked response of, oh my God, are they going to, you know, look at this and see, okay, here's a new adoption supply. Um, so I think a lot of, a lot of those questions were wrapped up 
um, in all of that, and, and especially when people started noticing that Bethany Christian Services, um, one of the largest adoption agencies in the US, uh, was involved in providing federal foster care for some of those, those separated children. And I think it's, it's a complicated question of whether or not those kids are at risk of being adopted, but you know, it, I think it's also an unanswered question, basically. How interesting, what has caused the drop off of um, international adoptions? What's that about? Um, a lot of different things. Um, I mean, it's, it's been, it's sort of country specific in, in a number of cases, um, you know, different countries. It, international adoption has sort of functioned as this like hopscotch game, hopping from hotspot country to hotspot country. Um, in the past, at least, you know, uh, in the mid aughts, Guatemala was sending huge numbers of, of children to the US each year. Um, and that ended up kind of encouraging this sort of gray market system in Guatemala, where a lot of kids were being recruited from families who a lot of times um, mostly were just poor. Um, you know, that's kind of the other big, um, you know, open secret about adoption is a lot of so-called orphans are not orphans. Um, yes. And, you know, so Guatemala got to this point where like there was just such a demand for adoption from Guatemala that they went out and started looking for, you know, the sort of kids that Americans wanted to adopt. This led to ethical issues. The ethical issues turned into scandals. Sometimes, um, it, sometimes, um, Aaron Siegel McIntyre actually wrote an amazing book called Finding Fernanda, uh, which is about a case of outright kidnapping. Um, I think that that is, you know, that's that's extreme. That's kind of taking the ethical problems to an extreme, um, but it's also real. Uh, but, you know, those scandals mounted to the point that, that Guatemala had to like put the brakes on things um, and, you know, kind of slow down, reassess, look at what was happening. And when that happened, um, a lot of the agencies that were working there just sort of picked up shop and moved to Ethiopia. And then suddenly Ethiopia was like a next adoption boom country. And a lot of the same things happened there. So in some countries, that pattern of sort of boom and bust uh, ended up leading to scandals so large that uh, the programs, the adoption programs were effectively shut down. Uh, in other countries, different things have happened. Um, you know, in, in China, there have just, there have been economic changes and social policy changes that have meant, um, you know, there is, there is both now, uh, you know, more opening for, for families to keep more of the children that they want. Um, and also there is this larger middle class that wants to adopt. Um, and so that has sort of slowed that that adoption market in, in Russia, there was this sort of unique situation of political retaliation against the US after we passed a law that they didn't like. So it's, it's sort of different things. Um, and and Jay Ron, I'd, I'd be really interested in, in your perspective on this as well, um, but they sort of add up to like, there have been all of these, a lot of times problems, and then sometimes these more neutral sort of social developments that have led to the reality. Um, you know, that for a while adoption advocates were calling the adoption cliff, um, like we're falling off the adoption cliff. Um, and now we're, we're just kind of, we're on, we're on the rocks, we're at, we're at the shore almost. Very, we do not talk enough about this, which means it's awkward to talk about. Um, Jaron, tell us, tell us more about that. Well, I, I just want to echo what Catherine was saying. I think that she described it very well. Um, we call them push-pull factors in kind of the sociological uh, research term. So we're looking at like what drives sending countries to expand programs or shut them down and then also the demand. I, I think the only thing that I can add to what Catherine already said, because I think she got it spot on, is that the demographics of children that are available for adoption have also changed over time. So um, one of the questions I know that um, I was asked to kind of think about was why do um, families go to inner country adoption versus all the children that are in the foster care system? And part of that is because there's a, this long-standing belief that you can get children that are younger 
So infants in Guatemala, that was one of the cases there. And for a while in Ethiopia, very longstanding in China and Korea as well, is that the children that were first available for adoption were very young. So you could get a child that was a year old or under in those countries. And, and as um, changes have happened in, in different countries, the demographics of those children have changed. So right now, currently, most of the kids that are available for adoption in other countries resemble uh, children in the US foster care system. Um, and so they're older, they have siblings, a lot of them have some kind of a disability or developmental delay. Um, and oftentimes they're there because of, they're in foster care or, or orphanages because of um, poverty, neglect, or abuse. Yeah. So really, they look very similar. And so it's no longer the case that you can go to another country and get a child that's younger and health, so-called healthier. Yeah. That's very interesting. It's so, um, it's, it is so interesting to think of this as an industry and supply and demand like children are commodities. That is the tension in all of this. And there are a lot of assumptions about it. It is, um, it's, uh, tell us your story, Jiran. So um, I, so one of the things Catherine mentioned that I, I was just kind of thinking about in terms of like the evangelical movement in adoption is that um, I was adopted from South Korea in 1971 um, when I was just under three years old and um, adopted into an evangelical family. And there was actually an evangelical Christian movement to adopt kids from China and Korea way back then. Um, and so my parents were part of a church group that um, had been uh, influenced by the Holtz, who are kind of famously Harry Holt and his wife, Bertha, also a very large family. They had uh, eight children and then they adopted eight more from Korea. And he um, really kind of promoted the idea that there were all these children in orphanages um, who needed to be adopted. And so in terms of inter-country adoption, that was one of the first large programs. I mean, there had been inter-country adoptions from Germany, from Japan, from uh, Greece, other places as well, but one of the first really large sustained programs. And even today, it's Korea is considered kind of the Cadillac of programs because they have such a process that's so smooth running that um, other programs have modeled or tried to model after South Korea. Um, and um, so I was adopted to an evangelical family, a white family in Minnesota. I was raised there. Um, and I think very similar to a lot of other transracial transnational adoptees didn't really know anything about um, Koreans or Korea or even about adoption until I got older, went off to college, started realizing I was part of this larger group of transracial transnational adoptees. Um, and for me, that translated into wanting to go into social work at some point and try and figure out. I always kind of say the story of how I became a social worker is um, I wanted to understand how a Korean kid living in the middle of South Korea could end up in a white family in Minnesota. Like, it doesn't just happen. There are all kinds of mechanisms that had to have happened both in Korea and in the United States for that to happen. And adoption, the social work adoption field is where all of those mechanisms really take place, those practices. So I wanted to understand how that could happen. So that's, that's a little bit about my story. And then I worked in child welfare for a while and that's where I started to have some questions even more deeply about our child welfare practices, adoption practices. Um, and I was looking at the research and was not very satisfied with what I thought the research on adoption, um, th their focus and the questions that they were asking. And so I decided to go back, get my doctoral um, degree so that I could do research asking those questions that I felt were missing from the literature. There is a lot missing and there's a lot of assumptions that are just taken for granted. Um, I worry about the assumptions of, uh, about biological mothers that they are wanting to give away their child or don't wanna raise it. 
when it may be entirely different. They may be the ones rescuing the child like, like Moses and, um, and assumptions about the adoptive parents that they are not inherently the rescuers. They, some I'm sure are exploitative. It, it is not safe to make these assumptions. I wanna take a moment and remind everybody to put questions in the box. We very much depend on your questions. We want, we love your questions and feedback. And, um, and that's really the heart of this program. And if a question is unanswered, those are the ones that will guide our future webinars. So please put us, put some questions in the box and um, we'll have them moderated and work on that at the end. So J. Ron, tell, tell us more about that. Um, how do people wrestle with understanding their identity, who they are, and why they're here? From the adoptee's perspective? Yes. Yeah. Um, so over the past, um, I would say, I will. So I first kind of entered into what we call like for in the Korean adoptee community, we kind of call it the CAD community, um, but basically adult adoptee spaces um, when I was about 30. So it, it was um, something that happened to me later in life. I grew up pretty isolated from other adoptees. And then uh, when I was in my uh, late 20s, early 30s, I started wanting to explore my own adoption, my own adoptee identity a little bit more, found the community. And so now I've been working, um, I've been in community with, I've been going to conferences. I started a blog in 2006 called Harlow's Monkey, where I wrote about my own experiences. Um, so now I'm in my early 50s. So over 20 some years, I've heard from hundreds and hundreds of transracial adoptees. And we all have our unique stories, but there are some themes that are really prevalent that, I've that have been shared over and over and over again, which is by far and large, we're really isolated, that our families do not connect us with other adoptees or with people of color. And mm -hmm. that it, it often comes to a point in adulthood where adoptees start to grapple with their identity for the first time, um, even if they do have the opportunity to go to culture camps or to be connected to other people of color. It's usually done in such a limited way. I call it, um, I've turned it drive-by culture, and that's where adoptive parents <laughs> will drive their kids to places where they can access a little bit of their culture. Um, it's not really that uh, far-fetched to say that it might only look like, you know, Taco Tuesdays or Chinese restaurant once in a while, or maybe a culture camp or a dragon boat festival or something that, that has a little bit, but it's, 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 it's mostly folk culture. It's not about what it's like to be embodied as a person of color living every day in the United States or whatever country you're adopted to that's oftentimes dominated um, with a white majority. And the racism and the assumptions, the um, cultural disconnect that you have, you know, of course, so I'll speak from my own experience, Korean adoptees, oftentimes there's, there's a large Korean adoption, or large Korean populations in some parts of the United States, but their experiences are really different than ours growing up. So we have a hard time accessing Korean culture, even in the United States, much less in our countries of origin. Uh, we don't speak the language. We don't know a lot of their cultural customs anymore. So for a lot of adoptees, encountering their own reference group for the first time can be really frightening. It can be very difficult. It can feel challenging. Um, you can feel really a sense of inauthenticity. Um, and so for some adoptees, that might actually lead them to shrink back and not engage with their reference community because they feel judged or feel some stigma about being adopted. And, you know, so it can be really challenging for adoptees um, trying to navigate who they are and figuring out um, where they belong. And we can talk about like a liminal space or being kind of in this neither, neither world, um, your culture of origin or your uh, racial group and community versus the white community where you're also not really fully accepted because you're always that 
person of color or the other one, you know, we would go out with our family. I'm the only person of color in my family and people wouldn't believe that I belong to that family, right? So it's this, um, it's a cognitive dissonance that we walk around with all the time. Um, and it can be really challenging for adoptees. So, and then, you know, as we grow up, especially when we have children, um, if we haven't had the ability to have any kind of a connection with our first families, children. having children means it's the first time we're genetically connected to anybody or maybe have somebody that looks like us in our family. So it's a whole life, lifelong um, developmental process. And I think most people think of adoption as just kids under 18 years old, you know? Yeah. Um, one of the things that make um, ad ad adoptive families healthy and um, what are the things that make them unhealthy? And what, what are those yeah. features? <laughs> um, I think one of the biggest assumptions that's made about adoption is that adoptees are a blank slate, that we're a tabula rasa, that we have no history or anything before our adoption. So not only um, is there this kind of misperception that the adoptive parent can just kind of like fulfill and make up for everything um, and totally imprint on an adoptee, there's just, you know, this, this uh, wrong assumption that we don't bring anything to the relationship we have with our adoptive families based on our histories and our and our background because we do I don't even if you're one day old or adopted straight from a hospital you still bring that history with you um, there's also an assumption that um, love is enough and that the adoptive family can kind of cure or heal any past traumas or experiences that an adoptee mm -hmm. has had and then the way adoption is practiced in the United States is really based on secrecy closure and a lack of transparency and that's really damaging because we know that just if you know anything about just family dynamics, secrecy is always um, bad. It always leads to additional trauma. Eventually, secrets are found out. People, you know, feel rejected, betrayed um, when they learn more about who they are and the circumstances around their adoption and their first family. So I just think that, you know, um, in private adoptions. There's been a big, large movement over the past 10 to 20 years for open adoptions. Um, when we're talking specifically about transracial adoptions and intercountry adoptions, a lot of parents would go overseas specifically to avoid having open adoption arrangements. So in some of the research that I've done with adoptive parents or what I've heard from adoptive parents is that going intercountry is a way to avoid two things. One, it's a way to avoid um, having any kind of an openness because people have been in adoption we're scared a lot of people are scared of the first families so in foster care adoptions they don't want to have openness because they see the foster the the first families as being abusive or neglectful and therefore shouldn't have a relationship with their child in a country they're worried um that at least with intercountry adoption those families are so far away they can't be an influence you know um yeah yeah, and so so I really think that um, there's this idea that adoption is about constricting and um, kind of adhering to this idea of a nuclear family that's really tight and bounded versus adoption as a, a larger expansive way. So that children have multiple different parents, just like parents can have more than one child, that families can be large and expansive. You know, I think if we could move adoption more towards that idea of expansiveness rather than restrictiveness and closure, then adoptive families would just be much healthier in general. And that is interesting. And I can remember these kind of uh, fights being played out at the state house and being very intense and very emotional. And most of us had no idea what was going on about open and closed adoption. Yeah, adoption is really the yeah, only that don't have the right to their original information, right? Like our whole foundation is based on a lie. And so for a country that values authenticity and transparency, the idea that um, I'm not pretending to be somebody else, the fact that my birth certificate says I was born to people that I wasn't possibly could be born to and in another country, 
just doesn't make sense, right? So my whole identity in the United States is predicated on a, a falsehood. And that's the same for all adoptees who don't have their um, original information and their own birth records and birth certificates. I mean, we should be able to own that. That's ours. That's our lives. It's our stories. That's very interesting. Um, and I think about the baby boxes and the foundling boxes that are uh, in Indiana. There's a movement to put baby boxes, uh, even though it was. It's always legal to take a baby to a to uh, you know, a fire department or a hospital, there's been a movement to put them in these incubator boxes that have alarms so that nobody is around them and it guarantees their anonymity. I understand what they're doing, but what we need to do is let people know that there are many ways to do that and not, not like reinforce that narrative that it has to be so secret, I think. Mm -hmm. Sue Ellen, we have so many questions coming in. It's absolutely okay. wonderful. And I know we had said 15 minutes at the end, but uh, Catherine and, and J. Ron, if you'll allow us to give more time to questions, is that okay with you? Sure. Oh, okay. I mean, they're, yeah. they're just flowing in and so many wonderful questions. So one question mm -hmm. is about the connection of the Hague, if it has had any impact on transnational adoptions. And sort of related, but not directly, is a question about um, Congress. Now that the separation of kids has happened at the southern border, is Congress, the U.S. Congress, paying more attention to the issues of transnational adoption. So if you'll look at the Hague and, and the U.S. Congress. Who would like to, who wants to go on that? Um, I can speak a little bit about the Hague. Um, I think the thing to remember about the Hague is that it sets up some guidance and um, some best practices, but it's not actually really enforceable. So um, uh, an agency who is found in violation or a country that's found in violation, um, I mean, they can, they can be critiqued for it, but ultimately there's no teeth to that. It's not, a, it's not a, there's no disciplinary mechanism to, um, to leverage against a country or an agency or an entity that doesn't practice it. I think the, the overall guidelines for the Hague is, um, is correct. I see them as being very similar actually to the Indian Child Welfare Act in terms of what they're looking for, which is um, I think best practice in general for what should happen to, ch to any child who finds themselves in need of um, parents, um, which is you know first to be within an extended family and then to be within the larger community and then in country and that inter-country adoption should be the very last choice. Um, and I think that in a very similar way that ICWA has laid out best practices for Indian children, um, I think it makes sense. Um, uh, Catherine, you might have more information, but in terms of our current Congress, um, no, I don't think that they, that this is a, I don't think this, so far from what I've seen, it doesn't look like it's been a priority um, other than to kind of halt, but from what I understand, there hasn't been any effort to actually change or reverse what's happening, just to halt the separation. And Catherine, maybe you know more. Um, not a lot more. I, I, I believe I read something this week um, that there may be a task force to, to start looking at reunification, um, but I don't, I don't independently have any additional details beyond that. Um, you know, I will say that I think one kind of meta issue that needs to be addressed at, you know, a, at a policy level and at a cultural level is, uh, you know, just how we think about adoption. Um, you know, how we talk about adoption as um, something that we should make more of. Um, that, you know, like it, it's kind of, it's, it's frequently been used and, and I think perhaps is a little less by some people who have started paying attention to these conversations, but I think 
you know, there's still probably this sort of status quo approach to it um, for a lot of politicians that adoption is this win-win. Um, it's this common ground um, in the abortion wars. You know, we don't have to talk about abortion if, if we just say, let's make adoption more readily available. Um, and, and that's not uh, that's not the problem. That's not the issue. And I, I know I'm kind of shifting from, you know, context of the border uh, separations and international adoptions to, you know, something that is at least a little more immediately an issue domestically. Um, but, you know, that there is this idea um, that kind of with a number of different, uh, you know, conundrums that we should answer it by making adoptions more accessible. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, we do see that in the abortion debate. It's kind of constantly promoted as this common ground solution. Um, we do see it internationally, um, you know, with people saying, you know, there are kind of continually camp campaigns still now, even as international adoption is so greatly reduced, um, that it should be made easier and, and more accessible. And, and we even saw it in the family separation crisis. Um, you know, Laura Ingraham on her show on, on Fox News um, was dealing with the family separation crisis by sort of toggling back and forth between mocking the idea saying like, oh, these kids, it's, it's like they're going to summer camp. Um, they're having the time of their lives. Um, and then saying, uh, because I believe she is an, an adoptive mother herself, um, you know, we need to make it easier for families to adopt these children. Um, and I, I think, you know, the common denominator uh, denominator to all of this uh, is, you know, or one of them at least, is that you are rendering um, original families invisible. And that was kind of like one of the truths that I, I feel like I came to learn in my reporting. Um, and, and I think one, uh, one adoption agency director, one of the ones who, you know, I think really tries hard to, to look at things in a holistic way and to kind of you know, try to have high ethics said, you know, this is the common problem of religious adoption or secular adoption, international, domestic, anything. It's, it's when you make, um, you know, she said the birth mother, um, but, you know, we could say just kind of all first parents or natural parents when you make them invisible, um, because that is a lot of what happens in, in all of these adoption discourses. And to go back, Sue Ellen, to what you were saying with the baby boxes, God, if that's not a very literal example of that, um, you know, you're not just making it secretive, uh, you're also making it extremely difficult for that mother uh, to go through any legal process of changing her mind, um, which is something that, you know, it's usually kind of based on state law, but, you know, there is a period of time to reconsider because there are a lot of things that can happen when when parents relinquish children for adoption, including, you know, really coercive um, and sometimes, you know, borderline worse than coercive, sometimes kind of forcible sorts of things that happen um, that can compel people into these situations that if, you know, they are legally entitled to some period of time. In some states, it's really short. It's, I think, you know, some states it's just 24 hours. Other states, it's like a month. Um, but if, if you put a child, in a, an infant in that baby box, I, I think your legal rights start to get very complicated. And, you know, I think, you know, it's, I don't think it's too cynical to say that's a little bit part of the thinking. And we don't even know that that's the mother putting it in the baby box. We don't know who that is. Oh, that, yes, that's true. And, and the, only, the other thing that I would like to add to what Catherine just said, because I agree so much um, with what, what she said is that adoption has become an intervention that was created to, so that we don't have to deal with all these other underlying issues that are a problem for families. Whether it's intimate partner violence, whether it's poverty, whether it's a lack of accessible childcare, what you know, there's all these things that we should be addressing as a society, as a culture that we're not, and adoption becomes the kind of fix all for that, ostensibly. I mean, it's not, you know, but it's much more complicated for that. But that's what it's become promoted as, um, 
And there have been ethical problems with adoption from the very beginning of adoptions. This is nothing new. It's, um, it's one of the few areas that's so, supposedly about like social services and benefiting people that has so much, um, there's so much classism and racism and ableism embedded in the way adoption is practiced that um, it's to say it's a win-win just erases all the other issues that happen in families that are the reasons why adoption ends up occurring. Yeah, it, it is um, artificially glorified and um, we, we really need to look at the problems that are driving some of it at least. And the disability angle is very, very important on that. Um, I think one of the questions coming in is about money. Where does money play in the adoption industry? It's huge. Um, oh my. So um, there's different, so there's a public and there's a private adoption mm -hmm. uh, fields. So public would be child welfare adoptions, what we know as foster care adoptions. Mm -hmm. Most states have partnerships where um, an adoption can be almost completely reimbursed. So other than just a few outlying expenses, um, most of an adoption uh, from foster care is reimbursable through federal legislation. Um, but private, um, as Catherine referenced earlier, is kind of like the Wild West. And that's where it really shows up as kind of a market issue. So um, domestic infant private adoptions are very, very expensive. Um, it can run 30 to 60, $70,000 to adopt one infant. Um, and then intercountry adoptions um, are getting pretty close to that. It's not uncommon for them to be around $50,000 to adopt a child from another country as well. Um, so, and, and then in terms of domestic adoption, depending on the agencies and where you're at, because white infants are the most in demand because when we talk about supply and demand, it's mostly white families that are seeking to adopt. And so white children cost the most to adopt in terms of agency fees, um, or if you're working privately with attorneys to do an independent adoption outside of an agency. And kids of color are uh, less expensive for their adoption fees. So there's also kind of a, a market um, value based on race as well. Wow. Um, Carrie, do you have more, uh, what are, you're monitoring the top questions. So many wonderful, wonderful questions. So one relates to the current makeup of the Supreme Court. Um, we have Justice Coney Barrett, who has paraded her adopted child. Um, and we also know that Justice Barrett is, is anti-abortion. And so the question, what are the impacts on the Supreme Court as it relates to who she is uh, in there, but also with all of the anti-abortion legislation that is happening across the US. Um, as, as you were just talking about uh, adoption being used as a panacea, as an intervention. Um, so Catherine, J. Ron, how do you respond to those part A and a part B of, of that question? Um, I, a bit of a tangent, but I remember, I think around her confirmation hearings, um, you know, and kind of all the requisite profiles of her family and, and her life. Um, I, I, think, I, I think I read this because adoptees were pointing it out, um, is that she spoke differently um, mm -hmm. about her, her biological and her adopted children. Um, speaking about her biological children, if I'm remembering right, kind of in terms of their interests and accomplishments, uh, speaking about her adopted children um, in terms of like struggles overcome, um, I guess kind of, or, or, or trauma. Um, in, in, am I remembering that right, Jiron? Um, yeah, was, yeah, I was part of an op-ed, we published yeah. an op-ed talking about that, yes. Awesome. Yeah, um, that was great. Yeah, I, I mean, so I feel like that's, you know, there, no matter how kind of like, it, you know, more of a sophisticated conversation you start to have about some of these issues, 
um, those old narratives are just right there like a cozy slipper um, for society to kind of put back on and, and slip back into um, these sort of, you know, uh, rescue tropes and, and which is very much, you know, also a white savior trope um, in, in most, uh, you know, adoption contexts. Um, I mean, I, I could easily imagine, you know, um, being uh, such um, a committed kind of anti-abortion um, having such committed anti-abortion personally and, and in her past judgments that, you know, that kind of combined um, with this sort of aura of adoption as, you know, this is a solution, you know, we're, we're, we're not, um, you know, uh, putting people in an untenable situation because they can always choose adoption. I, I could easily see that sort of language. Um, starting to come back up. Um, I mean, I don't, I'm not up on, you know, what all of the potential cases that might come before the Supreme Court are. Um, but, you know, there are, from time to time, there are, you know, cases that involve, um, you know, both both adoption laws. I mean, there, there have been um, big cases around ICWA, um, for example, um, and, you know, kind of, uh, when when do parents kind of have the law on their side if they're trying to keep their children, um, but also about things like crisis pregnancy centers, um, you know, yeah. which have served, um, you know, in the past as sort of this one stop on a sort of conveyor belt um, of, you know, convincing, you know, theoretically convincing um, pregnant people to choose life, um, though, frankly, a lot of, you know, a lot of times it's, it's, that's not actually the decision that's, that's being made. A lot of times people have already decided that they want to continue this pregnancy, um, but, you know, are, are looking perhaps for help um, to see if it's viable for them to be a parent. And a lot of times in the past, CPCs have partnered explicitly with adoption agencies and just sort of shuttled, um, you know, parents along, uh, you know, so you enter one place, um, you know, perhaps because of deceptive advertising, perhaps not. And, and then you find yourself, you know, maybe rooted to a modern day maternity home, um, maybe just partnered kind of in an outpatient sort of way with an adoption agency that is kind of constantly telling you this message, um, you are not worthy, uh, you are not prepared. Um, look at these upper class people who go on these really fancy vacations and all their pictures, like these are the legitimate parents, you should go with them. So I could imagine, if that sort of stuff came before the court, uh, it would have a, a fairly welcome reception with her. I would just add also that um, Coney Barrett isn't the only adoptive parent on the court, that Justice Roberts also has adopted children and that there have been some questions about the method that he used to adopt his children too from Ireland. So. I would say that overall, from what we know, the two justices, that they're probably going to be um, fairly amenable to uh, siding with adoptive parents in any cases that come up. Um, and I would also say that just um, adoption is one of the very few bipartisan topics that gets a lot of support from Congress, regardless of which party you're from. So. Um, the um, Congressional Coalition on Adoption. They put out the Adoption in, uh, Angels on Adoption Award every year. It's often supported quite heartily from both sides. Um, it's, it's just something that I think um, the narrative is so pro-adoption, whether it's connected to ab abortion or not, or any other kinds of uh, reproductive rights. It, it, it almost doesn't even matter how associated they are with uh, reproductive rights. There's just such a strong um, kind of value on adoption in general in our Congress. Who are lobbyists that we should uh, pay attention to or advocacy organizations who, who are principled and that you all would endorse? Advocacy groups? Well, yeah. well I mean, I mean, it's maybe a conflict of interest, but um, I'm on the board of directors for the North American Council on Adoptable Children. And so we also are 
uh, as an organization do some advocacy and lobbying work. Um, and one of the things that we are very interested in is looking at whether or not it's possible to uh, make amendments to the Multi-Ethnic Placement Act and Inter-Ethnic Provisions Act, which is the legislation that prevents uh, uh, federal agencies and adoption agencies uh, who work with foster youth being adopted um, to consider whether or not their uh, race and cultural and national origin should be considered as a placement factor. Because right now it's illegal to do that. Um, and so it's been promoted as a civil rights issue, but it's a civil rights issue because it benefits white adoptive parents who want to parent. Yeah. Um, transracially, not about what the child needs in terms of a culturally and racially affirming adoptive home. Thank you for that resource. Carrie. Um, so there are a few questions, questions about research. Um, one is in California, the statistics seem to be that within the juvenile justice system, upwards 50% of the kids in the justice system are adoptees. So how much research is really going into the connection of uh, juvenile challenges, you know, young people being at risk and adoption? So that's one question. And then there was another question about, so what are some of the research issues that are not being covered that really need to be covered? So I, I'm not aware of that specific fact, um, the statistic from California, but I will say that I know that adopted youth and youth with foster care histories are overrepresented in all areas of clinical mental health, juvenile justice and um, adult incarceration. And also that a lot of um, people who find themselves houseless also have a foster care or adoption background as well. So I know that we're overrepresented in, in lots of areas, unfortunately. Um, there are so many areas of research where I think uh, we haven't looked at yet, but specifically, I think the uh, voices of adult adoptees has not been fully covered anywhere close to what I would like to see it. So. I know some of the studies that I've been working on kind of show my interest in um, adult adoptee narratives and voices. So things like um, their experiences of being a parent, um, what, what it means to be a, uh, an adoptee and a parent. Um, I am just, um, I have a paper submitted right now based on a study of adult intercountry adoptees that experience an adoption displacement, meaning that they were either um, readopted from their first adoptive families or they were basically placed in residential care or kicked out of the home so that they did not grow up with their adoptive parents. Um, that's something that we don't talk about almost at all other than um, we've seen a few new story, stories like uh, the boy from Russia that was sent on a plane because his parent didn't want to, the adoptive parent didn't want to parent him anymore or the Reuters report on rehoming. But we have not to date really looked at what that experience has been like for adults now who had that history, who had that happen to them. Um, there's just a lot of things about being an adult adoptee, forming intimate relationships, uh, attachments, uh, how they want to start families, um, their own mental health. Uh, there's just so much. So for me, I'm, I'm really interested in um, really promoting research that has the voices of adult adoptees. And also, there's almost nothing on first families. I mean, first families are, talk about erasure. There's there's very, very little about first families. Wow. Um, if, uh, yeah, if I, um, what, what Jayran is talking about is I, in terms of kind of displacement um, is, is devastating. I, I've never done research on it, but I've done reporting on it. Um, you know, in, in one case, I, I looked at, you know, a, a group of a lot of Liberian children who were being disrupted because it was these, uh, you know, fundamentalist homeschooling, often quiverful type families that were deciding, oh, we're going to adopt, you know, six teenagers um, from post-Civil War Liberia and bring them into our, you know, kind of eccentric and very strict homeschooling life and expect that they're going to fit in. Um, and when they don't, in one case, um, 
they did exactly what happened with the famous story of the boy from Tennessee who got put on a plane back to Russia. Um, you know, I, I actually met two Liberian um, adopted uh, young adults who had been dumped on the streets of Monrovia um, and, and just left there because it, you know, their adoptive parents felt it wasn't working out. In, in Seattle, um, there was a whole group of uh, adoptees from Ethiopia who had all come from the same orphanage who all got, you know, disrupted from their families, you know, when they turned into teenagers. Um, and a number of them were unhoused um, or were couch surfing, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and also we see that, as J. Rand pointed out, in, in foster care. It, it's, they're not, they're not apples to apples, you know, um, inter, international or domestic private adoptions and foster care, but a lot of those issues are the same. And, and with foster youth, um, especially as they age out of being in the foster care system and receiving any sort of support, you know, as lackluster as that support can often be, um, they're aging out, you know, without, without any of the support um, that, you know, people who are coming from a family situation more often will have. Um, so I, I, I would say, yes, like double down on, we should look at that. Um, we should look at kind of the issue of adoptee citizenship, um, which Jaron, I think you've done, you know, work around this yourself, but like a lot of adult adoptees end up finding out they don't have proper citizenship um, and can end up being deported over very minor things, even if they've spent their entire life here. Um, and then also I would just say, um, both in terms of research and in terms of organizations to pay attention to, especially um, for first families and, and especially in the, you know, the child welfare context or the foster system context, um, to pay attention uh, to, to groups that, you know, provide legal defense services for these families. Um, because an overwhelming reason that kids end up in that system, um, which is just often, you know, it's documented in, you know, a lot of the time to be worse than having left them in a situation that is being termed neglect. Um, and, you know, that's kind of its own wrinkly thing, but, you know, a lot of times they are just being removed for issues that are straight up poverty. Um, and then they're being brought into um, a really unstable situation where they're probably going to hop around between homes, um, you know, many families, and then potentially residential homes as well, potentially be unnecessarily medicated, um, potentially have, you know, like more run-ins, um, with other type detention type kind of fields then then is you know anywhere like necessary so you know the organizations that are you know representing and fighting for the rights of families to raise their own parents um you know i i just i really strongly see that as a part of reproductive justice um you know the the right for these families to remain together mm -hmm. here in the u.s as well um as on you know on the border and overseas Agreed. and one thing we can all do is amplify those voices i think we're getting close to our um we're about to run over carrie do you want to take this and i want to ask one more part a part <laughs> I b do question too. um so those of you who need to hop off this is being recorded um but thank you for staying this long but this question keeps coming and and it is both about uh, white supremacy and Christian supremacy. And so really looking at uh, Christian supremacy and the agencies that, that are uh, Christian and their exclusion of LGBT individuals who want to parent. And then the other part has to do with uh, those who are trying to kingdom build in a way that's very Christian oriented or and or very white oriented. So J. Ron, Catherine, either of you, if you can respond to that and promise those, those will be the last questions. We're taking down everybody's questions though. Yes. Um, Who wants to hop in? Oh my gosh, trying to figure out how to even approach those questions. Um, yeah, we're seeing a reversal of rights for LGBTQ families to be able to adopt. 
And so that's definitely a civil rights issue that um, I've been paying attention to. And at the same time, I think that we also have to be careful that the rights of parents who want to adopt don't just supersede the rights of children too, and whether or not it's appropriate for children to be adopted. So, I mean, I just, I just wanna put that out there too, that sometimes we, I think, look at the rights of LGBTQ folks, and then we say their rights are more important than whether or not the adoption is appropriate or not. So um, definitely we should not be discriminating against those, those uh, prospective parents. Um, and we also need to be working on the other end to make sure that those are um, appropriate adoptions, um, just in general. Um, I'll stop there. Catherine, I don't know if you have anything you want to add. No, that, you put that very well. Um, yeah, I, I, won't, I won't touch that. I think you said that very well. You expressed what I think as well. Um, in terms of the, uh, the supremacy um, question, I mean, I think the Christian adoption movement has changed um, since the time I was first writing about it, um, you know, since the mid aughts and the early 2010s, um, you know, it was really flourishing. Then they were building kind of all these movements and like publishing all of these books. And they were really kind of bold and almost audacious in, in the things that they were saying. Um, and they were kind of presenting it as like, here's this way you can, you can save a child twice because you're going to, you're going to rescue a child as an adoptee. And then some of them were saying, you're also going to rescue them and save them because you're bringing this soul to Christ. Um, one one person um, even wrote one adoption leader, so not just a random person, but one leader. Um, ultimately, he wrote the ultimate purpose of adoption is not to give orphans parents um, as important as that is, but to place them in Christian homes so they can receive the gospel. Mm -hmm. um, so there was this evangelizing motivation um, that they wrote about extensively. I I caution that I don't think on the individual level, that is what was motivating, you know, all these individual parents, um, you know, but that was absolutely sort of part of, part of the water that this movement was swimming in. Um, and a lot of times that, that moved beyond just kind of religious supremacy um, to things that were, you know, pretty, pretty powerful examples of, of racial supremacy as well. Um, I think we saw that a ton um, in the aftermath of the 2010 Haiti earthquake, which Sue Ellen, you were talking about, um, there was all of this talk um, about we've got to go in there and, and scoop up all of these children. Any supply plane that is bringing things to Haiti should come loaded up with, like it should return loaded up with orphans. And people were talking about it as like, we need to save these children kind of from Haiti itself. And they started talking about it um, in all these really racialized terms, racist terms, um, you know, we need, this is a, a, a country that is um, contractually obligated to Satan. Um, some people were even saying, um, and you know, like, but it, even if they weren't saying something that stark, um, you know, saying Haiti just can't take care of its children. Um, the, the only future that they have is, is to get them out of the country. Um, it, so, you know, it was very stark in that example. Um, also definitely not, you know, a unique example. That sort of language has been used, I, I think, you know, since the real, since the birth of international adoption as a big industry, as Jaron was talking about in Korean adoptions, you know, there was a lot of language like that that was, that was tied up in evangelizing um, and racism and kind of white savior mentality. And that's, that's always a risk. Um, and so again, I, I mean, the, the adoption movement, the Christian adoption movement has changed. And I think I need to acknowledge that they have, you know, shifted a lot of their attention towards family preservation, and that should be applauded. Um, but, you know, that was, they were really kind of putting meat on the bones of those narratives, those old kind of very familiar narratives about adoption and, and salvation. And those kids are just coming of age now. Yep. So that's what I think is going to be really interesting and what I hope we'll see more in terms of research and then also just the, the narratives that you see by adoptees, whether it's through their own memoirs or art or other mechanisms that adoptees are taking control of their own narrative now. And I think we're going to see the results of 
those past practices. Wow, there's so many more things we really want to engage with you. Uh, this has been absolutely marvelous. And, and all of you who are attending, thank you for your questions and your comments and recommendations on resources, et cetera, et cetera, because we really need this to be a community that helps move forward to healthier ways of dealing with this. And J. Ron, thank you for your role in serving on the board. I did not know about that. That's, that's really important. Um, so let us know how we can support you in, in the work that you're doing there and, and glad your voice is, is part of that conversation. And Catherine, thanks for the research that you keep doing and keep writing about it so more of us are, are able to know about this. Sue Ellen Bronlin, board chair, thank, thank you. Um, and we urge you, if you have not registered for the upcoming webinar, please do so. The very next one is property and products, looking at the racial oppression of black women and their, their product and, and the varieties of ways that has happened. And we'll be looking at women in the anti-abortion movement. We'll be looking at um, a whole bunch of things. So come, please be here. The video recording will be available in the next two or by before the week is over. So thank you. Blessings to each of you and continue doing the amazing work that you're doing. The registration link was just put in. The, thank you, Mel, for putting the registration link to upcoming uh, webinars. It's in the chat. So if you want to take that before we sign off, please do copy that. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so Thank much. You <sighs>